and welcome back now i wasn't going to make this video but i thought i found it so interesting this thing here on my workbench yeah i know it's a bit of a chunky monkey this one i thought why shouldn't i tell you okay let's let's first of all let's have a look what it is and then we'll talk about why i've got it now a quick shout out to my sponsor jlc pcb they're doing a collaboration with easy eda as you know it's my preferred pcb cad program it's simple but powerful it's intuitive to use let's just have a quick look at a design i made recently so here's a fairly recent design of mine my esp32 web radio designed it in easy eda because it had all the features that i needed and uh, don't forget the teardrop feature that allows the tracks to be slightly bigger at the ends where they join pins and things to give them a bit more stability and then you just click the Gerber button at the top here. So that one there. And it says, great, you can either generate your Gerber files directly or order them at JLCPCB. And if you click that, it will go straight to the JLCPCB site, upload the Gerber files as it's generating them in the background automatically and uh, show you what you can do there. And let's not forget, they've got a Facebook group. Here it is. And as you can see, they're joining forces here a bit more transparently so we understand that the two are connected. Easy EDA to design your PCB and JLC PCB to actually manufacture it. Sounds good to me. And if you join the group, there's all sorts of good things on the way. So have a look at that as well. JLC PCB, go and have a look. So the, the main driver of this uh, is noise, actually, or the um, reduction of noise in my workshop. Now, as you can see, now I've got you know pretty large gorilla hands and this is this is a big chunky monkey and it is heavy my goodness is that heavy what is it well the title of the video probably gives it away it's a variac um, an auto transformer variac is in fact a trade name a bit like you know hoover and sellotape you know it's come to mean a generic sort of product but this is an auto transformer and uh, I eventually after weeks, and I do mean weeks, of, of procrastination and consideration and cogitation, I eventually decided this was the only way for me to go. In what respect, Bacon? Well, in my workshop, I have... Oh, come back, come back. In my workshop, I have a 16-inch fan over in that corner. There it is. Okay. Now, that's on, obviously, during the summer when it's hot, but even during the winter... I switched that on very low just to blow the warm air around from that heater that I mentioned a while back. Yeah, there, that one there, see? That's a convector heater, so the air rises up. But to get it swirling around the workshop, I need a very gentle sort of waft of air. Now, in my previous workshop, I had a, a, a different type of fan uh, that became very, very noisy. The bearings were basically shot, so I didn't bother bringing it with me. And I've got this one now. And I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just control that with a, a standard speed controller as I did before. Something like this, right? Now, this is basically what I had in my previous workshop. It's just a, a plug-in device, so no wiring required, and a, a, a speed controller on the top. And you can dim lamps on here and all this. Um, yes, it works, but my goodness, is it noisy, right? There's a buzzing either from this and or the fan i think it's the fan actually that buzzes more than this does but even in the instructions for this it says may buzz perfectly normal hmm perfectly normal it might be but why does it buzz uh, especially when i connect all this up and i've connected it all up and tried it out and it is 100 percent perfectly silent both this unit and the fan itself perfectly silent so what's the difference between controlling the feed of a, of a fan or other motor using one of these, one of these, or even one of these wall-mounted ones, which has all got my fan connected at the moment, these sort of, you know, dimmer affairs that you just turn the knob, push on off, whatever. What's, what's going on? Now, traditionally, to control a motor that's been run on 240 volts or whatever volt it is, it is in your country, you'd take the sine wave, which has been generated by your electricity company, and you would chop it up so that less of the power was being uh, delivered to the motor in question. Now, first of all, most dimmers in the early sort of 70s and 80s were leading edge dimmers, and the leading edge means the leading edge here of the sine wave. What we'd actually have is I'm delaying the start of that sine wave, then going up to where it should be, 
and then continuing the sine wave where it was. So this bit here is missing from your sine wave. And ditto, instead of carrying on here at this point, it waits a little bit, then shoots straight up and continues to where it should be. So this bit of the sine wave is also missing. So we're missing these bits of the sine wave. Depending, of course, where you put your, your little dimmer thing, yes? If you put it down here to the minimum, um, then this this point here is going to probably be about here. And if you put it at maximum, then you're probably not going to chop off any of the sine wave at all. But what you do end up is a very choppy output sine wave. And that's what makes motors buzz. But it doesn't damage them. It just It's just annoying, especially in my workshop. Now, more recently, we tend to use trailing dimmers for things like LED lights because it's a smoother transition. A trailing one will keep the, tr the beginning of it, come back down, and as it's coming back down, at that point it stops. Instead of following the path down here, it drops straight away and leaves that little bit there without power. Now that's fine because things like a motor, for example, would just coast. Uh, and LEDs, well, they turn on off so fast, it just doesn't matter. And ditto, although we should be following a sine wave like that, it goes, OK, I'll follow the beginning bit. And as it comes back down here, no, I'm stopping at this point here and not outputting this bit here. So once again, it's all a bit choppy, isn't it? But this works for motors by chopping that last bit off because the motor just will just coast but think what happening think what is happening with that coil that that motor of yours yeah running and it's a coil in here isn't it every time we stop the power going to it at this point here the field on this motor collapses and generates a huge spike of electricity within the coil that finds its way back into your poor little dimmer and eventually just kills it stone dead this is a trailing edge dimmer, so they cannot be used with motors. Well, not unless there's some clever electronics that also disconnects the motor or some sort of snubber mechanism to prevent the, the back EMF, as it were, finding its way back into that dimmer. Leading edge dimmers like this don't have that problem because all you're just not generating any electricity. Then suddenly the motor sees this, this electricity appear here at this point which might be 100 volts, and that's fine. Then it goes all the way up to the top, all the way down to zero here, and then coasts a little bit along here. Well, once again, there's still no, no magnetic flux to collapse and generate a back EMF within the motor itself. It's all being very carefully controlled. And then suddenly at this point here, it would see a minus 100 volts and start building up the power again. So leading edge is fine for motors, leading edge trailing edge most definitely not not unless there's some something else going on that i've yet to find because they will destroy the dimmer unit that you're trying to use why does a triac work then um, as opposed to any kind of leading or trailing edge dimmer well a triac is a coil just the same uh, as a standard transformer except that at various points along this coil there could be fixed tappings. We'll come on to the uh, the variable one in a minute. Uh, and the neutral line is brought out from the incoming mains voltage. So once again, you can see this is not an isolating transformer anymore. Now, this one here might be 200 volts here, 150 here, and maybe 50 here, tapped off. Now, this is not some kind of resistance thing. Let's not think about that this is not a wire wound resistor the magnetic flux of this transformer is being generated just the same 50 times a second and um, as it collapses it generates these different voltages at the different points of the of the coil and these these tappings are literally just soldered on at various points now we don't want soldered on in the var variac I mean, the, the name itself, you know, a variable transformer. So once again, we have the coil, yes, and the neutrals brought out each side. But on here, we literally have a wiper, which is normally a carbon brush or something, that 
that wanders up and down here, touching the various points of this winding here and bringing out the voltage here. But what you have to be careful of, of course, is that this, this wire here is connected directly to the line in wire here. So if we're at 240 volts here, whilst the voltage at this point might be, say, 200, it's still connected to the line by virtue of this, this transformer, not isolating. Yeah, and we can have a variable transformer all the way from 240 all the way down to zero, pretty much. So what's the big advantage of this thing compared to the leading and trailing dimmer? Well, the big advantage is that the AC coming in shape is exactly the same as the AC coming out. It's a standard transformer. There's no distortion or modification of the sine wave. So if we suddenly wanted to have an output of 100 volts here, Yep, we'd get 100 volts and the sine wave would just be correspondingly smaller. But it wouldn't be distorted anyway. We'll see that in the oscilloscope a bit later on. Now, I've actually had to zoom back out really so you get a much bigger shot because this thing is just so big and chunky. Now, the current that this can give out is 2 amps. Okay, um, and yet look how huge that is. I'm having to use, you know, two hands to pick the thing up. This is the, wi the, um, the winding rotor here. So this is where we tap off the voltage as we go around. And all this is, it's a coil wound like that, all right, thousands and thousands of, of turns. But this bit here, this edge has been obviously pressed in the machine so it's nice and flat. And then they've, well, sanded off, for want of a better word, the the varnish insulation that I mentioned. You remember I said that? So this has been taken off so that this wiper can go around. And that wiper is no more than a carbon brush, which you can see there. Yeah, that little black thing, that's the carbon brush. In fact, they give you a spare one in here because they know that that wears down over time. Well, in my case, I think that's highly unlikely because I'm not going to be constantly changing this. But if you were changing it, say for a, a lathe or something, then that could wear down, you know, pretty quickly. Now, it's so huge and big because we are talking um, mains voltage, right? And the power that this is obviously going to have to dissipate is half a kilowatt, which is quite a lot, isn't it, when you think about it? Normally, in the Arduino world, we're talking, you know, 5 volts, maybe 9 or 12 to power some equipment, not, well, up to 240 volts, which is what this gives us. Yeah, that rattling you're hearing is, is this here. Now, if you notice, the dial on here goes from 0 well, pretty much to 270, yeah? Because if I were to connect it in a slightly different manner, if I was to connect it between A and not C, which is the other end of the coil, but D, do you remember I said that if we carried on winding a little bit, that bit there, this is the extra winding, the output from E and A would therefore be greater than the voltage between A and D. I don't want that though. I don't ever want to put 270 volts into my fan. So I've, I'm going to connect the mains between A and C and then take the wiper from E and effectively the neutral from A. And that gives me between 0 and 240. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen on the dial then really. If this dial has been calibrated for the 270, does it mean it's totally out or is it just does it just stop don't know frankly i don't care because it's not the voltage per se that i'm interested in it's just the speed of the motor now obviously i'm in the middle of putting this together um, into an insulated box which is just i was going to order a, a plastic one but that cost almost as much as the variac itself which incidentally cost 50 british pounds that's about 70 us dollars i suppose it's not cheap yeah when you consider that something like this a leading edge dimmer um, or indeed a, a trailing edge dimmer would cost something like eight, ten, twelve pounds. Yeah, it's it's a huge investment. But as I say, I spent weeks and weeks and weeks deciding whether or not I could live with that awful buzzing sound from that fan, and decided no, I couldn't. So this is the box it's going into. It's just a, a wooden box. As you can see, I've sort of stuck it together and primed it, ready for painting. I might I might just paint it sort of magnolia so it matches my walls. Oh, those holes, they're for little tiny screws that I've got to hold this in place. Because this is so incredibly heavy, 
I'm just going to look on the spec sheet here to see how heavy that is. So this is the spec sheet, uh, and the highlighted line is the one I've got. Look, 2.9 kilograms, it says there right at the end. 2.9 kilo. That's, that's a lot of weight, isn't it? And that's the 2 amp version. I mean, look at the amps you can go up to. If you wanted a, you know, a 10 amp or something, look how heavy that's going to be. 8.5 kilograms, good Lord. It would rip itself off the wall. Yes, and incredibly expensive as well. This is the smallest one I could get that was going to manage my needs. My fan is only 45 watts. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous, but that's about the smallest one I could find. And it's, it's okay, it might be made in China, I suspect, but at least it's supplied by a UK company. So I've got some kind of uh, support mechanism in place. Right, I'm going to put that in here. And if you're wondering what that hole there is, that's for my output, so the, that fits in there. Now, normally, these sockets would go onto a patris, but I, f I felt that was going to make it really, really clunky and look, you know, why is it sticking out so much? It doesn't have to, does it? So I've cut it out. That goes in there, nice and flush. I'll just bolt that through. There's enough room in here, width-wise, for both the Variac and these, and the wiring will be nice and neat then. And uh, when I've done all that, I'm coming back to this video to give you a demo of the fan and how smooth and quiet it is. Okay, until then. Okay, so here's the setup on my workbench. I've got the Variac here, which I'm very, very careful not to go too close to, because as I say, all these connections at the top are live. Okay, even the one in the center, which is the wiper, doesn't matter how low that voltage is, it's still connected directly to the mains input. So I've lashed together this with a socket on the output and I've put an extension cable on here that goes to the fan. Now what I'm going to do is actually film the fan on a different camera as I do this, not something I normally do, but otherwise it's just going to be too awkward to do it. So let's um, turn the power on. You might hear a beep from the fan as the electronics within it sort of switches on. There we are. So the fan is now live, the electronics within it. Now if I turn the fan on, without touching any of this. I've got this set to more or less the mid position at the minute. So let's turn the fan on. Um, and initially it's on the slowest position. Now I'm going to go really close to the fan with the other camera. So I'm right behind the camera, the, the thing now. And that bit up there we're not using at all, okay? Now, I can tell you without you having to try and listen and turn up the volume, it is silent. There is no noise at all. Okay, so that's good. So <clears throat> if we just turn up the Variac a little bit, you should see the speed go up as well. Right, there we are. So the speed on the fan has now increased. You can probably just make that out. Now this is still on the slowest setting, remote control wise. So if we up that to the fastest setting, medium, fast. Now, now we're getting some wind noise, but only wind noise, no buzzing of the motor or anything else. So let's turn that back down to get a gentle breeze wafting over us rather than this hurricane. Yeah, that's, that's quite nice, given that we don't actually need much cooling today. So there we are. So that's now running very nicely indeed. And once again, zero noise. Let's see what happens then if we stick a multimeter on that and see to see what we um, can get. Okay, multimeter is just clamped to the top of the uh, terminals here, which once again I'm not going to touch once I put the power on here, so let's turn that on. And you can see immediately the multimeter reads 133 volts, which is quite a bit different, isn't it, from the 240. And if we turn this clockwise, you'll see that go up. And there we are, that's at full rotation, and uh, it says 238 volts or thereabouts, which is what we have in the UK. Now turning it all the way around the other way should bring it down to zero, or just about that. And it says, okay, 0.3 volts. That's good enough for me. Now, you might say, can I see the voltage output on here on an oscilloscope? Well, no, not really. I'm never going to connect up anything connected to the mains onto an oscilloscope because the oscilloscope is grounded. So if I connect the ground terminal 
to the neutral over there. Yes, the two are sort of bonded together inside the house, but remember my workshop's got a separate earth. And to be quite honest, I'm just not, not prepared to go there. You get slight differentials and it could blow up my oscilloscope. So we just, just take it from me that the sine wave output from this is as good as the sine wave coming in on the mains over here. That's the whole point really, isn't it? Actually, let's just think about that. That's not quite true, is it? Here's the probe for my oscilloscope, right? The, the black lead that I've now clamped to the cable here so it doesn't get touched is presumably at ground level, but ground is really on this thing. It's the neutral, isn't it? Point A over here. So as long as I don't connect that to anything, if I just stick the probe on the wiper, I think we should be good to go. Hmm, okay, let's turn the old oscilloscope on then and uh, we'll see what happens when I connect up. Right, let's turn up the, the wiper then, so there's nothing showing at the minute. So I'm turning it up, there we go. Now you can see that growing quite happily. And look at the, the function of that uh, sine wave. Let me just zoom in on that sine wave a little bit. Look at that. Very nice indeed. So I'm turning it up and up and up. Pro I don't know what voltage that is. I can't quite see it. 70 volts, it says. So I can turn it up a bit more. Let me just change the scale of the oscilloscope. There we are. There we are. Bring it down to that. And turn it up a bit more. Yeah, we must be at 100 volts now, must be? Oh, it's 148, it says. 148 volts. And a bit more, 176. There we are, look. Now, the, the thing to look at, though, is the format of that sine wave. That sine wave, compared to a leading or trailing edge dimmer, well, there's absolutely no comparison, is there? So no wonder the motor's nice and quiet. Hmm, cool. Okay, so we've done it. Hurrah! Right, just before we shut up shop today, quick update on the Pico, which you see down there. Um, I said I was having trouble driving an I squared C screen, which normally under the Arduino would be very easy because we have libraries and things. Well, as you can see, more or less, a little bit, little bit dim, isn't it? But you can see that there is stuff being uh, transmitted on there. Just a sketch I found, I tweaked a little bit, but it's it works, except the, the downside on this now is, Whenever I download this particular sketch, it kills the USB connection. So if I try to download anything else, I can't. I have to go back to the, the classic Arduino IDE to download the Blink sketch or something by putting this into bootloader mode, you know, pressing that boot cell. And uh, yes, it downloads that, then I can. Then I can come back to this and download it again. So obviously, that is not right. And others of you have already told me um, I seem to have updated the framework outside of the IDE, so I'm going to do some work on that as well. But this is still an ongoing sort of investigation, really, exactly what it can and can't do. Good. OK, I think we're done here today. Enough. Uh, please don't forget to go and visit my sponsor. After all, you know, they're keeping the, the show on the road, as it were, and they've got some good stuff there, as you just saw from that board. Very good quality stuff, so go and have a look. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.